Welcome to the uh, first video lecture of Chapter 5, First Section 5.1. Uh, as always, I'm Dr. Scott Spaniel, your instructor for statistics at Morton College. Uh, and so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about probability rules. So you all have just finished up the first uh, part of this course, which is on uh, differential statistics, uh, which is probably the statistics you're most familiar with if you've done any pre previously uh, in other classes. Things like finding mean, median mode, making graphs, uh, standard deviation, things like that. Now, the study of statistics is actually uh, mostly focused on taking sample data and expanding it for the entire population. So part of this is being able to figure out how likely um, something is to occur given your population data, and that's where probability comes in. So we're going to spend uh, the next three chapters uh, of your book and these video lectures looking at um, how... Um, probability works. And this will allow us then at the end of the course to spend the last uh, uh, third or so of the course looking at inferential statistics, which is using probability uh, to take sample data and expand it to make guesses at what the population parameter is. So, uh, like always, uh, you can take out your note sheets and follow along with me. Uh, they can be found on Blackboard or in our uh, the course on my math lab. Uh, and so let's go ahead and do that. So we're on page number two. of these note sheets. Okay, so probability is a measure of the likelihood of an event. So it's how likely is an event to occur. Probability describes the long-term proportion with which a certain event will occur in situations with short-term uncertainty. So Things where we can't know for sure what's going to happen in the short term, but over the long term, we can kind of figure out a pattern of what should occur. The law of large numbers plays a big part in this, and it says, as the number of repetitions of a probability experiment increases, the proportion with which a certain outcome is observed gets closer to the probability of the outcome. Okay, so what this is saying is, uh, it's not unlikely for me to flip a coin and get five heads in a row. But if I flip a coin a million times, about half of those are going to end up being heads and about half of those are going to end up being tails. And that's kind of the idea of probability. In probability, an experiment is any process with uncertain results that can be repeated. The sample space, S, of a probability experiment is the collection of all possible outcomes of that probability experiment. So if we want to list all the possible outcomes, that would be the sample space. So the sample space of flipping a coin once is heads or tails. Uh, the probability of rolling a six-sided die is one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, the sample space for a sporting event are win, lose, and maybe tie if that's an option. An event is any collection of outcomes from a probability experiment. An event may consist of one outcome or more than one outcome. We will denote events by uh, with one outcome, sometimes called simple events, using lowercase letters. And in general, events are denoted using capital letters, such as capital E. Okay, so those are some of the just definitions we need moving forward. So the probability of an event E, which is written P of E, so P parenthesis E, we use what, uh, if you remember back to algebra classes, is called function notation. So this just means the probability of event E happening must be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. So remember, we're dealing with proportions here, um, which are related to percents. And so basically what we're saying between zero and one, we mean from zero to a hundred percent chance of happening. So we could write that um, in numerically in a mathematical language as zero is less than or equal to P of E, which is less than or equal to one. You could even say something like zero percent is less than or equal to P of E, which is less than or equal to 100 percent. The sum of all the probabilities of all the outcomes must equal one. Okay, because that should make some sense. If you're going to Look at all the possible outcomes in an experiment. 
then you should end up with a 100% chance. Because if you're doing something, there's a 100% chance one of the possible outcomes will happen. We could write this as E sub 1 plus E sub 2 plus dot 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 plus E sub n equals 1. Okay, so that's how you would write that numerical outcome. A probability distribution lists the possible outcomes of a probability experiment and each of the outcomes probability each outcomes probability. So you should be familiar with the word distribution by now. We used it in chapters uh, two um, and three quite a bit. Remember, a distribution is simply a list. Uh, so when we did a frequency distribution, it was a list of all the frequencies. When we do a probability, a relative frequency distribution, it's a list of all the relative frequencies. When we do a probability distribution, it's a list of all the possible probabilities. If an, uh, if an event is in, impossible, so it cannot happen, then its probability of that event is zero. If, a if an event is a certainty, then the probability of that event is one. So if an event can't happen, then it's probability of zero. If an event, uh, um, if an event has to happen, um, then that would be a probability of one. That would be a certainty. So like examples of this, um, well, let's do one more definition, and then I'll give some examples. An unlikely event is an event that has a low probability of occurring, typically an event with a probability less than 0 0.05 or less than 5% is considered unusual, but that is not set in stone. So examples of this, um, you know, I'm going to use a hockey example real quick, and then maybe I'll come up with another one. So it is impossible that the Blackhawks will win the um, Stanley Cup this year because they got knocked out of the playoffs. So they have no more chance to do it. So the probability of them winning the Stanley Cup would be zero. Um, it's unlikely that they'll win it next year. Now, I don't have a mathematical number for that. That's just a joke because I'm a Blues fan. Um, but anyway, back to the actual examples. Um, another example here is if you flip a coin, it's a certainty that you will get a heads or a tails. Those are the only two options. So the, the probability of getting a heads or a tails would be one. Okay, so those are that's what we're talking about when we talk about impossible and a certainty. There are two basic uh, general methods for calculating probability. The first one is we can approximate probabilities using the empirical approach. So empirical just means uh, experiment, basically, or trying it out. So the probability of event E is approximately the number of times event E is observed divided by the number of repetitions of the experiment. So the probability of event E is approximately equal to um, its relative frequency which I don't think is what I want to write there Oops. don't remember exactly what I want to put in this blank but let's do it this way I, um, so that would be the number of mm, Nah, let's leave it like I had it before. Relative frequency. So that would be the number, the frequency of E divided by the total number of outcomes. Okay, so that's one way to do this. Another way to do this is to use the classical method. And the classical me method uh, depends on um, the events being a certain type, which is what this next blank is about. So an experiment is said to have equally likely outcomes when each outcome has the same probability of occurring. Okay, Not each event, but each outcome. So things like flipping a coin has equally likely outcomes. Rolling a fair six-sided dice has equally likely outcomes. Uh, drawing a random card from a deck of playing cards, that has equally likely outcomes. So if an event has n equally likely outcomes, and if the number of ways that the event can occur is m, then the probability of event E is m divided by n. 
So if S is the sample space of the experiment, then we could say that the probability of E is the number of things in event E divided by the number of outcomes in the total experiment. So notice these are pretty similar ways, the empirical approach and the classical method. The empirical approach uh, depends on uh, collecting data um, or looking at what's happening in the real world, but the classical method is based on what should happen if all the outcomes are equally likely. So let's look at some examples of doing probabilities using these two ideas. So let's start with uh, this first example up here is using the empirical approach. So a survey of 500 randomly selected high school students determined that 288 played organized sports. What is the probability that a randomly selected high school student played organized sports? Okay, so to do that, the probability of organized sports is just 288 divided by 500. So that would be 0 0.576. And ways to interpret that probability, you could interpret it as if a high school student is chosen at random, there is approximately a 57.6% chance they play organized sports. Okay, so that's the idea there. Okay, so now let's try one using the classical method. So that's what's going on down here. So exclude leap years from the following calculations and assume that each birthday is equally likely. Okay, um, This last part is important. We have to assume that that's true because it's not actually true. So we're going to assume that every day uh, is equally likely that somebody will be born on it. Um, but in reality, there are there are kind of ebbs and flows throughout the year as to when people are most likely uh, to give uh, birth. Uh, in fact, real quick, let me see if I can pull up. Okay, so like here's a chart. Um, we could show you, there's a bunch of different options, but here's one. Um, can I make this bigger? Yeah. Okay. So these are the most popular birthdays uh, based on um, collecting data in the United States. So you can see that um, people are more likely to be born in the middle of September really than any other time throughout the year. Okay. So that's an interesting fact, but so these are not actually equally likely. So we have to assume that they're equally likely. And this is one thing you do need to be careful about when you're doing probability is make sure you're either, um, they are equally likely events or that you can assume they are. And in this case, they're telling us to assume they are so we can do this. So to determine the probability that a randomly selected person has a birth date on the first day of the day of the month. So all we have to do to do that is probability of first day of month is, first of all, can I just do 1 divided by 12? Right, because each month has one, and there are 12 months. Well, that one doesn't actually even make any sense, so ignore what I just said. So what we want to do is we want to do the number of first days divided by the total number of days. Okay, so how many first days are there? Well, there are... 12 first days because each month has a first day and there are 365 days total. And so for that one, we get 0 0.033 for our probability. Second one says determine the probability the randomly selected person has a birthday on the 31st day of the month. So the probability of the 31st day of the month so that's not going to be the same as the previous day one, right? Because every month has a first day, but not all the months have a 31st day. So the number of 31st days divided by 
the total number of days. Or just, I don't need to write the word total there. Just the number of days uh, in a year. So uh, you could look at your calendar app to figure out how many of there's, these there are. There's actually, if I switch my camera real quick, there's an interesting way. Um, you can do this with your knuckles. So if you take your knuckle uh, and you count peaks and valleys, uh, it'll tell you months. So January has 31 days. February doesn't. March has 31 days. Um, April doesn't. May does. June doesn't. July does. And then start back over at the beginning. So August does. September doesn't. Um, November does. Uh, October. August does, September doesn't, October does, November doesn't, December does. And so that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, okay. So January, Feb, uh, March, May, June, July. So that, yeah. October, December. So Dece there are seven 31 first days uh, in the year so seven divided by 365 and so that's 0 0.019 okay so about two percent of people should have birthdays on the 31st day of the year determine the probability that a randomly selected person was born in december well so what so if i want to do the probability of december you might think you could do the number of uh the number of Decembers divided by the number of months. But the problem with that is the months are definitely not equally likely because um, December, for example, has 31 days. February only has 28 days when we're not in a leap year. So it's less likely that you would be born in February than December. So we can't do that because those aren't equally likely outcomes. So what we can do instead is the number of days in December divided by the total number of days, right? Because we're assuming days are equally likely. So that would be 31 days in December divided by 365 total days, which is about 8.5% or 0 0.085. Determine the probability the randomly selected person was born on November 8th. So that one's actually uh, even a little easier because it's one day. So how many November 8ths are there? divided by the total number of days. So that's one out of 365. So that's 0 0.003. So that's less than half a percent point chance. So if you just met somebody and she asked you to guess her birthday, are you likely to guess correct? Well, what is your likelihood of guessing correct? Well, it would be this, right? Because uh, the probability of being November 8th is the same as the probability of it being any other day. So the answer to that would be no. This is unlikely because 0 0.003 is less than 0 0.05. And then we kind of already talked about this, but do you think it's appropriate to use methods of classical probability to compute the probability that a person is born in December? And the answer to that is in reality, no, because birthdays are not equally likely, right? What we what would be a better plan would be to use the empirical method and use data like this to calculate things like that. Because you could see a lot more people are born in September than are born in December. Okay. So uh, back to the note sheets. So at this point, what I'd like you all to do is... Pause the video and try these problems that are fairly similar to the ones we just did. Okay, so now that you've had a chance to try these, let's go through these together. So what is the probability that a randomly selected adult female volunteered at least once in the past year? We just take the number of volunteered in the survey divided by the number total number in the survey. So that's 0.31, 31%. And you could say, if you randomly selected a adult female in the United States, there's a 31% chance that she has um, volunteered in the last year. Okay, that would be the interpretation. Okay, what is the probability that a randomly selected tulip bulb is red? Well, you just take the number of red 
divided by the total number. So that's 0.4. And then what's the probability that they're purple? You take the number that are purple divided by the total number, which is 0.25. And then you can interpret those probabilities um, the same way. You have about a, if you reach into this bag and randomly select a bulb, you have about a 40% chance of selecting a red one and a 25% chance of selecting a purple one. Okay, so those are the basics of the empirical approach and classical method for doing probability. So let's try to expand this a little bit further on and talk about some of these other definitions that we talked about earlier. So in a national survey of, of a survey conducted by the Center for Disease Control to determine college students' health risk behaviors, college students were asked, how often do you wear a seatbelt when driving a car? The frequencies appear in the following table. Construct a probability model for seatbelt used by, by a driver. Okay, So to make a probability model, we simply have the responses and we need the probability of each. So to find the probability of each, I first need to find the total here. So add these all together. So 118 plus 249 plus 345 plus 716 plus 3093 is 4,521. And then we just need to divide each one of these uh, to get the make the probability model. So we'll have never is 118 divided by 4,521. Rarely is 249 divided by 4521. Sometimes is 345 divided by 4521. Most of the time is 716 divided by 4521. And always is 3093 divided by 4521. So do each one of those calculations, and then you'll have your probability model or probability distribution. So 0 0.0024, 0 0.0551, 0 0.7063, 0 0.1584 and 0 0.6841. Okay, so the prob for example, the probability that a student always wears their seatbelt is about 68%. Is it unusual for a college student to never wear their seatbelt? Yes, because 0 0.0024 is less than 5%. It's actually less than 1%. So it is. Very unusual for a college student to never wear a seatbelt. Okay, so that's it uh, for that example. So why don't you guys pause the video for a moment and try uh, make it doing this second one. Okay, so now that uh, these are ready, uh, now that you've tried this one, Notice they gave us the total, so you could skip that step. If you added these all up, it would be 642, and so now we divide each one. So 4 divided by 642, you should get 0 0.0062. 6 divided by 642 is 0 0.0093. 133 divided by 642 is 0 0.2072. 219 divided by 642 is 0 0.3411. 90 divided by 642 is 0 0.1402. 42 divided by 642 is 0 0.0654. 143 divided by 642 is 0 0.2227 and last but not least 5 divided by 642 is 0 0.0078 okay so there's our probability model our purse snatching larceny is unusual so purse snatching is right here that's 0 0.0093 which is less than 0 0.05 so the answer to that is yes our bicycle larceny is unusual 
Well, that's 0 0.0654, which is not less than 0 0.05. So the answer to that one is no. Bicycle larcenies are not unusual. Okay. So that's probability models uh, and how to make one using a frequency distribution. So now what we want to talk about is how can we make a probability model? Uh, how can we find the sample space for a classical approach? And that's the last thing uh, we're going to look at in this section. Okay. So determine the sample space of the experiment. So in 2008, Six Flags St. Louis had eight roller coasters. The Screaming Eagle, the Boss, River King Mine Train, Batman the Ride, Mr. Freeze, Ninja, Tony Hawk's Big Spin, and Evil Knievel. Of these, the Boss, Screaming Eagle, and Evil Knievel are wooden roller coasters. Ethan wants to ride two more roller coasters before leaving the park, not the same one twice, and decides to sec select them by drawing from a hat. Determine the sample space of the experiment. Okay. So, the key to making the sample space here is you just have to think about what things could happen. Well, the first time he reaches in the hat, he could draw any of these. Then, he could draw another one out of the hat, but it won't be the same one he started with. So, what that means is all of his possible outcomes are each one of these paired up with the other ones. Right? That would give us the entire sample space. So, we could go ahead and write that out. So, what you want to do is you've got the Screaming Eagle, and now I want to pair that up with each one of these. So, I've got the Boss, Screaming Eagle. Uh, Screaming Eagle with River King Mine Train. Screaming Eagle with Batman the Ride. Screaming Eagle with Mr. Freeze. Screaming Eagle with the Ninja. Screaming Eagle with Tony Hawk's Big Spin. And Screaming Eagle with Evil Knievel. Okay? And that's how this is going to work. You're going to pair up each roller coaster with all the other ones. And that'll make your sample space. Because he could draw either one out of the hat first, any of these out of the hat first, and then he could draw any of the other ones out second. So if he drew the boss out first, then he could get the Screaming Eagle second, River King, Mine Train second, Batman the Ride second, Mr. Freeze second, the Ninja second, Tony Hawk second, or Evil Knievel second. And then if he gets River King first, he could get Screaming Eagle, or he could get the Boss second, or he could get Batman second, or he could get Mr. Freeze second, or he could get the Ninja second, or he could get Tony Hawk's Big Spin second, or he could get Evil Knievel. Okay, and this is going to take a minute, but that's what we're going to do. We want to do uh, each one of these things. So if he, uh, next option, he could get Batman first. And then he could get Screaming Eagle second, the Boss second, River King Mine Train second, Mr. Freeze, Ninja, Tony Hawk, and Evil Knievel. And then he could get Mr. Freeze first. Followed by each of these. And then he could get the ninja first, followed by any of these. And then he could get Tony Hawk, followed by any of them. And last but not least, he could get Evil Knievel first. Followed by any of these.
Okay, and those are all the possible outcomes that could happen. So now what you need to do is you need to go through and you can use these to find uh, the probabilities of these. So first of all, how many total outcomes are there? Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight columns, and each column has seven in it. So that would be 56 total options. So all of these are going to be divided by 56. So what is the probability that Ethan will ride Mr. Freeze and Evil Knievel? Okay, so what we need to do is we need to find the options that are Mr. Freeze and Evil Knievel. Okay, so Mr. Freeze and Evil Knievel both. So here's Mr. Freeze and Evil Knievel. So he could ride Freeze first and Evil Knievel second, or he could ride Evil Knievel first and Mr. Freeze second. So that would be 2 out of 56, which is 1 out of 28. Okay, what is the probability that Ethan will ride the Screaming Eagle? Okay, well that's all seven of these, right, all have the Screaming Eagle, and then all seven of these also have the Screaming Eagle. So that would be 14 out of 56. which is one in four. So there's a one in four chance that he would ride the Screaming Eagle. What is the probability that he will ride two wooden roller coasters? Okay. So we need to figure out what is, uh, which ones of these have, um, are both of them wooden roller coasters. So um, the boss, Screaming Eagle, and Evil Knievel are all wooden roller coasters. So we need... Both of those. So Screaming Eagle with the boss. So there's one. Screaming Eagle, Eagle with um, Evil Knievel. So that's two. The boss with Screaming Eagle. And the boss with Evil Knievel. And then Evil Knievel with Screaming Eagle. And Evil Knievel with the boss. So that's six total. So six out of 56. Which is three out of 28. And then what is the probability that Ethan will not ride any roller, wooden roller coasters? Okay. So the ones that don't have any wooden roller coasters. So that gets rid of all of these things uh, that have Screaming Eagle in them. right? These all go away because they all have the Screaming Eagle. These all go away because they have the boss. Um, then we can get rid of the ones with Screaming Eagle, the boss, and Evil Knievel. And then all the ones that have Evil Knievel. So that leaves us with one, two, three, four, five rows of four. So that'd be 20 out of 56, which is five out of 14. Okay. And so that's it. That's it for, uh, oh, well, that's the last example that we're going to do together. So now what I'd like you guys to do is try doing the same thing for this problem on page seven. So take a minute and do this problem. Pause the video and then we'll go through it together. Okay. Okay, so let's go through this one together. So determine the sample space of the experiment that is list all the possible random samples of size two. So you're gonna pick two people to go to a conference uh, together and you're gonna randomly draw their names out of the hat. So John could come out of the hat first, followed by Roberto, followed by Clarice, followed by Dominique, followed by Monica, Marco. Then Roberto could get chosen first, followed by John, Roberto, Cleese, Roberto, Dominique, Roberto, Marco. Okay, Clarice could get chosen first. Clarice, then John, Clarice, then uh, Roberto, Clarice, then Dominique, Clarice, then Marco. Dominique could get chosen first. Or Marco could get chosen first. Okay, so there's our sample space. So what is the probability that Clarice and Dominique will attend the conference? So same idea as before. Find the ones that have both Clarice and Dominique. So C, D, D, C. So that's 2 out of 20, which is 1 in 10. So there's a 1 in 10 chance that they both go. What is the probability that Clarice attends the conference? Okay, so that's any ones that have Clarice. So that's this, these four that Clarice gets chosen first. And then we've got these two, both have Clarice, and these two. So that's one, two, 
four, six, eight. So that's eight out of 20, which is two fifths. So there's a two and five chance that Clarice will go. Then what is the probability that John stays home? So what is the probability that we don't have John? So I can cross off the ones with John. So all those are gone. All these are gone. And so that leaves me, one, uh, that leaves me with um, 12 where John isn't going. So that's 12 out of 20, which is 3 out of 5. Okay, so that's it uh, for this video lecture. Let me go ahead and just put my face back on the screen. So that's it for this video lecture. Uh, if you have questions about any of this, feel free to email me or send me a remind message. Um, and also don't forget to do your homework, and we'll see you either on class or in the discussion, depending on your class format.